few more coming in, Grand. Yeah. So uh, welcome everybody to our second edition of Outside the Rails. And uh, this time we're joined by Hannah Bell. Uh, she is our uh, critic for social development and housing. And she, she also sat as one of our two green representatives on the uh, Special Committee on Poverty recently, together with Trish Altas. They tabled their, uh, their report to the legislature in uh, last fall, or actually in November, December? Yeah, November. Um, and obviously the, the work in the committee there has, uh, has gotten Hannah very, uh, given her a lot of ideas about um, what we need to do to eliminate poverty on Prince Edward Island. So she is working on a bill uh, to uh, basically require the government to create a strategy and uh, uh, a poverty elimination strategy and uh, an action plan. And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. She wants to uh, talk to you about her bill and get some feedback from you. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go over uh, a little bit of housekeeping here first, just let you know how the session is going to flow. So first of all, Hannah is going to present her bill, uh, let us know where it came from, what uh, she intends for it to do. Uh, then we're going to open the question, the floor up to uh, questions uh, to make sure that everybody understands what the bill is about. So not getting into a discussion about the content of the bill, but just making sure everybody's on the same page. And then we are going to open it up to general feedback and suggestions uh, on the bill. So we're going to have ourselves a good discussion today. Um, you are encouraged, uh, just so that we can make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak, who wants to speak, to um, indicate um, either in the chat or by raising your hands through Zoom. <laughs> and if you haven't raised your hands on Zoom before, um, if you find the reactions button in your Zoom toolbar, it's usually like right around where you'll find the chat and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is an option there under reactions to, uh, to raise your hand. Um, and also, please feel free to use the chat uh, every uh, liberally. And I'm going to just type something into the chat here so that if you uh, don't already know where the chat is, uh, you probably see something lighting up orange because I said hello, everybody in the chat. Uh, sorry, I just misspelled that, I see, everybody. Uh, so that's, that's where you can um, type comments. If there's something that you want to say or an idea you have, and uh, you know you might not necessarily have a chance to say it out loud during the conversation, because at the end of this, we're recording this session, and I'll be able to export the chat and uh, send it over to Hannah so that she has a record of, of everything that anybody wanted to say about this. Um, I will also be uh, trying to take some notes uh, as people are speaking into the chat, so that uh, in addition to the the video record, we also have. Uh, a little bit of a written uh, notes record, uh, which could be useful from this. So if you see me doing that, that's why. And um, yeah, so with, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Hannah and ask you, Hannah, to tell us the story about this, uh, this bill that you are drafting right now. Sure. Well, thanks very much, Jordan. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I can see some of you and some names. I recognize many. So it's... Um, it's really great to have the opportunity to do this. We've we've all, you know been really struggling sometimes with ways to um to to have a chance to kind of have a, a collaborative discussion on on the work that we're doing. And often when you're doing some of this work, you know you feel like the nerd in the basement. And uh, it, it's um it's really great to get the chance to 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 bring it forward and get feedback. Um, and just to let you know some of the stuff that we're working on. Um, so. I, I've been working on and around um, poverty as part of an overall um, work on social justice for many years in lots of different ways, but the role I'm in now gives me a unique space to be able to actually do something, um, bring something forward that, that has and can have a direct impact through, through law. Um, I was involved um, in a number of different poverty reduction activities um, in different groups before, and so I have been well aware of, of, sort of a lot of the, the shortfalls um, of programs and services that are delivered to try and address poverty. Um, over the last few years, though, the reduction and elimination of poverty um, has been getting louder and louder as an issue 
not just sort of provincially, but federally and, and internationally. Obviously, we have um, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goal is to end poverty in all forms everywhere. That's a pretty clear statement with a target to reduce um, at least by half the proportion of men, women and children of all ages living in poverty by 2030, which is not that long away at all. So with the previous government, the, the Liberal government, there was a, a quite an extensive consultation and work done um, to release uh, what was put out in 2018, the Poverty Action Plan. Um, it was done with a lot of consultation and a lot of community engagement. Um, it wasn't at all a perfect document, but it was the first time that some of the words and language around poverty were actually put down and, and acknowledged by government. So, you know, we need to put recognition where recognition is due. So it outlined actions, there were no targets, um, and it outlined really clear um, actions um, and has some very specific commitments in it. So remembering this is under the previous Liberal government, um, with the new government that came in in 2019, they adopted that poverty action plan in principle. Um, it was referenced in, um, in the throne speech, but there hasn't necessarily been any clear progress um, other than some of the things that you can kind of check off the list, I guess. Um, and there's then some, certainly some of the key foundational actions that were part of the, you know, necessary to make the action plan function were never implemented either under the Liberal government or under the current government. Um, and those are some of the areas that I've really focused on with this legislation. The other key thing that, that, that we've got in here, are, apart from sort of commitments that have already been made in writing and committed to by both the Liberal and the Conservative government, but not necessarily acted on, um, was that in the original throne speech, the official opposition were, were asked to provide um, key things that we wanted to see included in that throne speech as part of the sort of nod to the collaborative approach. Um, and we specifically sought a commitment to the elimination of poverty rather than the, using the words reduction. And that actually was in the throne speech, the first throne speech by the King government. So we have this kind of um, trail of, of really, quite, not just breadcrumbs, but kind of, you know, full on loaves of bread that kind of help us sort of show that, that there's already been um, some really significant commitment, but we're tired, we, I'm speaking we as the official opposition and me personally, I'm tired of waiting to see somebody do something about this. Um, so we started working on this idea of legislation last year. We didn't want it to interfere with the work of the special committee, which had a very specific mandate, but we also knew that the work of the special committee would give us an amazing amount of input and information uh, around, you know, the, the lived experience of poverty and PEI and the data that we needed to be able to show that we weren't um, in the words of some other um, colleagues of mine, you know, maybe exaggerating or making this up. Um, so so that, that work from the Special Committee of Poverty not only gave us the report about basic income, but it also gave us absolutely solid numbers, data, um, and, and references that we can use to sort of tell the story of what poverty looks like, not just from the, the story of how it impacts individuals, but also how it impacts our society, um, and our economy, which we know are, are that that's the language that works for for politicians who come from a different perspective. And I guess that's the final bit around this when I talk about this generally is one of the things it's not normal in, in, in our old way of doing things for op op opposition to bring forward meaningful legislation. Um, as you know, I have never had any truck with that and I'm perfectly happy bringing forward legislation all the time um, because I think a you need to break the the, the rules are there to be broken but also um, you know we have we are that we have been elected to bring a voice for people who don't see themselves in in the legislative space and um, our voice part of the way that we express our voice is by bringing forward legislation that otherwise wouldn't make it into this space so not only have we really been changed the narrative in, in um, our government spaces around poverty and the impacts of poverty and the importance of poverty, but it's also our responsibility to bring forward legislation that is challenging. And like we did with climate leadership that Lynn Lund brought forward that actually really pushes people to commit. Um, and that's a really big piece about this is that we can't continue to talk about talking about something. Um, we actually have to put 
you know, put our cards on the table, excuse the cliche, but we have to put our cards on the table, we actually have to commit. Um, and that's what this legislation is designed to do. So Hannah, can you tell us what are the key elements uh, in your draft legislation that would create that sort of accountability and sort of help the government, you know, help make sure that we're moving the dial on eliminating poverty? So what this, this legislation does is create a really solid framework. Um, it's, it's, um, it's the frame that kind of everything else would hang on that sort of uh, sets out very clearly in law the requirement on, of government to act. It doesn't tell them how to, it tell, but it does say why they need to do it and what the broad strokes are that they, they need to do. The key things it does is identify a minister responsible, which isn't just um, a you know a name tag piece. It actually means that that minister has a responsibility for ensuring that actions are being done towards meeting targets. They're the ones that have to report on it. They're the ones that would then have to champion it. And we know that any major change, you have to have a champion. So the minister responsible is, is really critical. Um, it making clear who is responsible via that strategy or plan when planning and reporting will take place and even when the plan gets reviewed. So it's actually the requirement to make a plan, not just sort of say, here's a list of things we're going to do, but sort of how are you going to get there? Where are you going? Who are you going to consult with? It ensures that we have a, 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 a collaborative leadership team between government and community. So that's through the establishment of a poverty reduction council. Um, who actually have authority over the report, which is really important. So the report, uh, the reporting that happens annually on this would not be coming out of government. It would actually be done by the council, presented by the minister, but it, that council who are ordinary individuals from across the province, then are the ones that actually get to say honestly and openly, this is how it's going. Um, and then also the other key thing is it sets targets, uh, which okay. are based in evidence, but they're tough. Um, and they are meant to challenge, to push government into action within a time frame. So you can't kick, keep kicking this down the road. And what, what is that time frame? Uh, do, you, do you have a sense of when, when you would like this strategy to be uh, implemented or, or what are your, so, yeah. your targets? So we're aiming, we're aiming um, as long as the, um, sorry, I'm just, I'm just scrolling very quickly through my screen so I can actually find get my dates exactly but the um subject to the feedback from consultation we actually already have the legislation drafted which is what's available on our website now what will happen is based on on feedback that we get there's going to be some tweaks in there so we may need to add in additional stakeholders names or we may need to change or add additional data but with the overall legislation is done it's it's, it's ready to go and those tweaks are not hard to do um, so we are aiming to bring this forward this in this coming sitting in february um, if we're still polishing it, you know, the last minute bits and pieces, it doesn't have to be tabled on the very first day. We have the entire sitting and we know that this sitting is going to be a number of weeks because it also is a sitting that includes the budget. So, um, you know, if it doesn't get there until the beginning of March, that's fine. We've still got the time and it will be a priority for us. So the legislation itself is going to get into the legislature floor, ideally for debate, mm -hmm. um, like in the next month. <laughs> yeah. um, should we be successful in getting this legislation through relatively unscathed, so without any major changes, um, it will become effective immediately. So on proclamation, which is basically when you have the, the proclamation at the end of a sitting and the Lieutenant Governor comes in and reads the bills, that that's when they become law. So that means that then it would be immediate that, the, that to meet these targets, the government would actually have to, to move straight away. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've actually we've even got sort of some clarity in there that says in your first year, like, we, we you know, you're going to need to get your data <laughs> points all sorted out. Um, and then the first targets are due in 2025 mm -hmm. or sorry, 2026. So it's five years. So we, we've assumed that there's a year for them to kind of get all the stuff together that they're going to need to be able to um, um, measure because you have to start with what are where are we right now? So collecting that data is not a small thing. Um, getting everything set up, getting the council set up, and then we would begin measuring from January for, we would begin the, the plan would take effect from January 1st, 2022, and then the first target uh, uh, would be, that, you know, within that, that five years. And, and they're significant. They're, they're looking for, you know, a, a really significant impact on, particularly on chronic homelessness mm -hmm. um, and uh, food insecurity in children. Yeah, and I, I see from your draft, uh 
the uh, the consultation draft that you're uh, calling for a 25% reduction in poverty by 2020 or 2026, I guess now, right? Yeah. 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 So that's pretty significant. Yeah. So there's um, an overall um, of poverty in general, which we which we we establish is measured against the market basket measure, mm -hmm. and then within that, we've also then set even more aggressive targets for those two particular priority areas, which is chronic homelessness, and as I said, food insecurity in children. Knowing that that particularly with food insecurity pieces, when we begin to affect that, then then the overall poverty rate is also affected. But um, mm -hmm. but we wanted specifically to address those. Um, Primarily because of the the uh, the impact that that would have in in our populations that are most at risk. Yeah, and you know, I I was uh, I was personally really quite quite surprised when I was reading your uh, the report of the special committee on poverty, and uh, and it said that there were close to fifty thousand people who uh, meet the definition of of poverty or are under the poverty line using the market basket measure. I'm wondering, is that something, is that a number that surprised you or, uh, you know, other colleagues in the legislature? I'll be blunt. I'm known for being blunt. It has shocked the hell out of absolutely everybody. Mm. I mean, it's the initial reaction is that people say like, like it must be a typo or, mm -hmm. or like, how can that possibly be true? We're talking about one third of the population of the province sits at or below. And this is measuring by the market basket measure. Um, mm. I guess there's, there's a whole bunch of things we could do. You know I love to talk. There's a whole bunch of things we could say about it, but there's, I guess, a couple of really key things about it. Yes, that number is true. The market basket measure is actually a richer measure than some of the ones, than all the ones that our government currently uses. Um, so when we, we don't have a clear measure of poverty prior, prior to having this from Stats Canada, so what happens is we tend to underestimate because we are so, um, thank you, Pauline. So the market basket measure is a national number, uh, agreed um, measure that is set by stats using Stats Canada data, and it is done regionally for the whole country. So the number is, there's actually three different measures, numbers for PEI. So you can imagine there's hundreds and hundreds for across the country. And it's literally a, a, um, a kind of a, a number of the measure of how much income you need to have to be able to meet your basic um, needs. Um, and it's done by assessing the cost of a measure of different things, including your rent or mortgage, bills, food, utilities, transportation, education, healthcare. So all the things that you would need to meet your basic necessities of life. Um, and then, how you know and and uh like i said so the number for pei in charlottetown is different than the number for um thank you jordan for um um the number in nunavut and so on so it means that we've got a really consistent number that we can agree that we measure it by it is significantly higher than the number that was that is currently used by the provincial government to assess your ability to be eligible for social assistance. In fact, it's 50% higher. Wow. It's also 50% higher than the average income for a senior. So you can begin to understand why, when we, when we talk about how much money do people actually need and do we agree that if you don't have that, then you are poor, which is what the market basket measure does, that we've only got this now for the first time ever um, and agree that that's what we're going to use but there's a whole bunch of people who previously weren't counted um, and a large chunk of those people in PEI are um, seniors in particular single seniors who are more predominantly women than men single parents people with a disability and young single adults Right. So, um, so what that, that number, yeah, I mean, so right back to your question, sort of, um, it, it's absolutely shocking, even for somebody who works in and around this all the time, because it says that, you know, people are continually on the edge of the abyss all the time. Mm -hmm. And, and that that means that there's a large number of people who are working this is, you know, really, really have to change the number that that idea that 
um, pe welfare, people who are poor on welfare. Yes, they are, but they are also working. Right. Sometimes they're working two jobs or three jobs mm -hmm. and they're still not able to make ends meet. And just for reference, uh, I believe it's something like $22,000 a year for a single individual. Yeah. And about $36,000 right. for, for a family of four. Is that right? That's about right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have any any questions uh, for for Hannah about about her bill before we get into the meat of the discussion? I was just going to have a look at the chat here. I saw some things going by. Yeah, I was just writing some some notes there for people to have for reference about the market basket measure. Perfect. Oh, I see. Uh, Darcy made a comment there about this is why CERB was so good for PEI. It was the most money a lot of people have made in years. Yeah, I mean, I saw somebody just today on Twitter saying that that when that, that CERB paid more money than if they were getting sixteen dollars an hour. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was fifteen, fifteen something an hour. Um, so yeah, really, really, really difficult. I mean, and you know, keep in mind too that there are a lot of people who um, were not eligible for CERB because of the the work requirement and the and, and so on, who uh, who were the ones that probably needed it the most. Yes. You also can't, you know, we we have. Um, we have a huge reliance, you know, our, that's something I talk about a lot online is um, our reliance on our charitable sector has become normal, but it isn't normal in, for people to have, for us to have food banks the way that we do. It isn't normal mm -hmm. that the, to be able to make ends meet, you have to be on social assistance and do a part-time job and go to the food bank, you know, if you're a mom with a couple of kids. Absolutely. Um, and so, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion around a lot of the challenges when we talk about this is, is, is having to break through what people think, think when they think about what poverty looks like. So we've got a question from David Woodbury. David, do you wanna go ahead with your question? Yes, uh, I'm wondering, in, hi. Hi, hi David. Um, in, that, in those statistics, uh, is there a, a division between like um, Charlottetown and rural poverty? like city poverty versus rural? That's a really great question. Um, <clears throat> Stats Canada does identify three different kind of groups they, and they identify it by, by population. So we have, you know, a greater than 30,000 um, semi like urban, semi urban, which is less than 30,000 and then um, or, uh, rural. Um, it's quite hard to get a breakdown though of the data, like who's in what areas. Um, and that's something that we have to, we're going to need to really make sure we do if this legislation is successful it, and it's, it's called the disaggregation of data. We need to make sure that we are, we are really separating out, um, rural, urban, male, female, senior, um, because that's the only way that we can actually then create programs that address the specific need. Right. Um, and that's a really, that's one of probably the really big gaps and partly why this legislation is so important is it, we cannot make good policy decisions and develop good programming if we don't even know where to go or who it's for. Yes. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of shame, right? There's a lot of shame as well, you know, in, in a culture that, that values your job. Yes. Um, there's a lot of shame in, uh, and that's, a, and so there's so many barriers. Um, so we need to be able to kind of collect data, but protect people's confidentiality and their dignity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank I'm you. Gonna go, thank you for the question, uh, David. I'm going to go over to uh, Emily. Please ask your question. You can un unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, sure can. Hi, Emily. Oh, perfect. Hi. Um, Hannah, did you find, uh, why do you think that the data wasn't there before? Oh, why um, do you think that hadn't been collected like that? Yeah, I mean, Stats Canada have a, have a phenomenal data thing that they collect. We've, we've one of the challenges we have with Stats Canada for PEI is that we are so, that we are so small, <laughs> so the the numbers start to get right. so small that that it becomes really challenging for it to be um, um, what's called statistically relevant. So when they're looking at stats, you know, on the big scale for all of Canada. Um, and so I think that's a bigger question around sort of the manpower at Stats Canada and how detailed they get. But at the same time, mm -hmm. we, get, mm -hmm. we get good enough data from Stats Canada that we can do the market basket measure math. Um, we don't collect data provincially. 
and that's the gap. So, mm -hmm. so you know, if we can take what we get from Stats Canada and then match it to what we have provincially, then we can get the whole story. But if you don't collect it, then we've got nothing to match it to. And a large chunk of that is because poverty doesn't exist as a as a file. We only mm -hmm. have we have social yeah. assistance, which is for the very specific piece around um, welfare our welfare programs and and you know for seniors the same thing seniors who need assistance are tracked but not seniors who, right. who don't <laughs> um and so that's right. one of the reasons why we need to establish this responsibility because most of the jurisdictions i mean you know believe it or not one of the best jurisdictions in terms of knowing what's going on is alberta and they, that's because they established mm -hmm. a, a like a a ministry for poverty about 15, 20 okay. years ago. Um, and they've got, you know, they've got everything in place. We, we can put a lot mm. of stuff together, but there's a lot of it that we're just missing. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, like, awesome. I can't tell you, you can't right now them. how many ho people are homeless. We don't know. We have no idea. Oh, yeah. Right? right. We, 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 you know, yeah. So there's really major gaps that way. Right. Yeah, I'm going to go over to, uh, thank you very much, Emily. Thank I'm going to go to Glenn. Good Hi, Glenn. Hi, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. Good. So I, I have a question, and it's this. How much of our poverty uh, uh, rate is related to seasonal work? And how much of our poverty rate is related to unemployment? You can pay someone all you like on, a month, on an hourly basis, but if there's no work, that doesn't help them out. So I wonder about seasonal work. And I wonder about unemployment. There's a connection there that helps explain our poverty rate. Yeah, th there definitely is because you know when you look at that's went right back to the question about the fifty thousand. Um, you know, we, people islanders know that we've we've got a couple of things. We've got a cash economy, so you know that that reported income may not match the income that people actually have. So that's one piece of it, but also. The, the seasonal thing of, you know, feast or famine um, actually creates more stress. So, you know, over, you may actually not even be showing up as in poverty, but the stress in managing your household and managing, you know, I, I know families where they're, they're really well off when it's seasonal work and then they're at the food bank in the middle of the winter when everything's dried up, right? So we also, when we build legislation or something for ourselves, we, we have to recognize the unique situations of being in PEI. Um, there's going to be people who are who really struggle, who might not show up because of what they their what their their tax return says. And then there's going to be people who um, who are showing up the numbers that are actually okay. And then there's going to be a whole bunch of other people in the middle. But you know, one of the big things we have to be careful of is connecting poverty to work um, because um what the lot of this, this information tells us is that you can be poor and be fully employed right and so i think what you know what you've probably will probably notice in this legislation is it doesn't doesn't tell it doesn't set out how it doesn't say what are we going to do um because there are so many things that we have to do and there are so many different opportunities. So it could be everything. It could be raising the minimum wage. It could be changing the kind of jobs that are available. Um, it could be a basic income. It could be free childcare, and it could be all of those things. Um, and so the goal is to make it better. But how we get there is going to have to be unique for PEI. But you're absolutely right. I think it's a really important point that we need to talk about in PEI. Our seasonal co economy makes things different than it would be if you were doing this in Ontario or in BC or in Northern Ontario, or, you know, anywhere else. Thanks very much for the question, Glenn. I know that's, that's a really good. great example of what Hannah would uh, call a wicked problem <laughs> 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 that we have here on PEI. So Hannah, speaking of, of wicked problems, so I'm, I'm wondering how um, how we here can can help you, uh, and I'm wondering um, if there are any particular aspects of this bill that you find especially tricky or potentially controversial that mm -hmm. um, that you specifically are looking for feedback on. Uh, it, the whole thing is going to be tricky, um, but but um, I think I think there's a couple of big things that that are really important here. Just this, just like. The, the questions already are kind of, I've got, you know, 
I know Jordan's doing notes, but just the comments and things like we make sure that we don't forget, you know, that these these experiences are also need to be reflected. I know I'm going to get asked um, how how would we do this? So even though it's not in the legislation, the more feedback we have from people of, of the things that they think we should be either paying attention to, make sure you do this, or I've got a really good idea about what we could do. Um, because what I'd like to do is provide that along with the legislation when we when we when we bring it is, you know, we've got lots of feedback from people and they're really they're they're really engaged with this and this is what they want to see happen. Um, I think the other thing would be, you know, are we are we being are we remembering everybody? Is there is there anybody that that we you know I, I think I saw a comment in there about a different youth, like a consideration of a different youth range, um, and I have to admit that's something that I've talked about a lot because we talk there there isn't a really clear definition of like child, youth, young adult, and so on, and we know that there are lots of really different pressures um, depending on how old you are and and where you are in your life. So that's the other thing is, you know, is there something, an experience or a group that, that we really need to pay attention to, even if it's not in the legislation, because the next thing that you do after you pass legislation is you build regulations and the regulations kind of set out the, how, you know, the rules around um, and definitions and, you know, all that kind of thing. And that's where we can put a lot of that detail. Um, and that would help this move quickly. So that's the kind of stuff that, you know, the legislation itself is pretty dry, <laughs> right? It's, it's pretty prescriptive. It sort of sets out, this is what we need to do. But, you know, to Glenn's point, um, maybe, you know how I've got in there, I've got a list of sort of the, um, the different uh, groups or, you know, um, stakeholders. I think, you know, to Glenn's point, should we add seasonal workers? Um, as as, a, as an affected group, because it, it, there, there is going to be a different experience there, and that could be a really good way to make sure they don't get left out. Okay, thank you. And I'm just uh, posting a link to the uh, consultation draft again uh, for anybody that came late and, uh, and would like to be able to bring this up, uh, maybe on, on your computer or another screen to, to check out. Um, so let's let's get into, into some more discussion. So at this point, um, Feel free to still ask questions if you have them, um, but also if you have specific, uh, you know, feedback or suggestions, uh, just like Darcy was asking about whether the um, 18 to 24 definition of youth was, was adequate or uh, whether that should be a larger grouping. So um, I'll just Im invite you to, uh, you know, raise your hands. Uh, a few people here have figured out the hand function, or if you don't, <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you uh, if you if you can't figure out how to raise your hands, uh, you can just say something in the chat, and we'll we'll acknowledge you and and let you come up with your question. And Jordan, did you add the note around the um, the David asked around the rural? You know. Oh yes, ensuring... yes, yes. Sorry, yeah, I was distracted make, at yeah, that point. Because that's another that's another example of you know of a of a focus group within the um, the list. Also, urban, I... urban poverty. Mm. Also, just from a merely political angle, yeah, uh, it's good because I think some people, rural people, see the Greens as being a bunch of uh, uh, bourgeois city folk. I think it would be good to uh, to include that yep. just for us as Greens. No, it's a really good point, David, and I think, you know, it's, it's about inclusivity, right? Where everybody needs to see themselves in there, and, and, and but not everybody has the same lived experience. Um, yes. And when we're dealing with poverty, um, that, that makes it really challenging, right? Like we have, you know, people who don't feel safe or secure to, to share their story, um, so, but we still need to make sure we're speaking for them, so. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, uh, Hannah, I know there's um, uh, there's a lot of people on PEI uh, who are what you call like house poor, or you know they might they might own their their home but you know have a very low income. Uh, how how does that fit into the market basket measure for poverty? Is it basically if they've got their house paid off, does that make them perhaps um, rise above that level or? 
No, that, so the market basket measure doesn't take into account assets. Right, um, okay. um, I mean, for those who aren't familiar, for, to be able to get social assistance um, or to be qualified for um, assisted living as a senior, you have to dispose of your assets before you can be eligible for any assistance. Um, and so there's there's social assistance or or supports are are seen as punitive. They are punitive. <laughs> you're you're punished. Um, bef, bef, and there and that and there's a huge challenge obviously with that. So one of the key things with the market basket measure is is it it doesn't it recognizes that your assets assets are not cash. They're not liquid, right? And so it, it's really about a snapshot in time that says you know. It's the money in the bag. Like, do you, what do you have? It's the paycheck to paycheck thing. What this? How much should you need to have as income or as money that you have available to you to meet your expenses in a month? Um, and there are lots of measures, you know, within that that matter. Like, we know that you shouldn't be paying more than about thirty percent of your of your income on housing. Well, I don't know very many people who are renting right now who are paying less than fifty percent. Mm -hmm. Right? That's so that then impacts how much you've got left for other stuff. Um, long answer, but the short answer is no, you're not, you, it doesn't take into account assets. Um, that, that gets a bit more complicated when you're talking about delivering something like a basic income, mm -hmm. um, which is where the guaranteed aspect of basic income becomes really important, especially yeah. in our housing market now, right? Where, where, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got a lot of money in your house, where are you going to move? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And uh, how, how would you see uh, a basic income guarantee sort of interacting with the goals of this legislation? Um, if we had it, would, would that basically take care of itself or uh, would there be more work to do? Well, there'd definitely be more work to do because, you know, anything like that is, is feels like it's simple, but it's not. I mean, it, you know, there's the, the, a huge complexity. Um, at the minimum, because what we found with our report on the basic income guarantee is that you would still need an awful lot of other social programs, even with a full basic income guarantee. Um, an example would be somebody who is disabled um, would still need disability support programs and access to special health care and um, you know uh, assistive supports. In addition to um, you know a working mom would still need childcare. So mm -hmm. there's there is always going to be a need for other social support programs, even if we have a basic income guarantee. And so you you don't sort of take one away and put the other one in. Um, the, this legislation, though, would be really important. I think it, I personally think it would actually make us being able to do a basic guarantee here in PEI easier in the big scheme of things, because it shows willing. It shows that we mean it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also provides a framework and an accountability that we would need if we were going to partner with federal government. The federal government is not going to turn around and give us $300 million a year if we can't show that we know where it went mm -hmm. and that we can demonstrate outcomes. And so one of the things, if we want to address poverty, is we have to be able to show that we've moved that needle. If they're going to invest that kind of money, what did we get for our money? Did we take that poverty level and start moving it down? So it sounds very cold, but measurements really matter because if you can demonstrate impact rather than just saying, hey, we think it's working, if you can actually show here's where we were because we measured it and here's where we are now because of this investment, that was money worth investing. Right. Um, and we can't do that if we don't have this framework. So I, I, I personally feel like we're not going to get a basic income guarantee in PEI unless we have this in place. Because why would they do it? We haven't been able, like to Emily's point, we don't measure anything. Yeah, in any department, <laughs> do we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. So yeah. please, please don't be shy, everybody. Um, feel free They're to- They're all really quiet. You know, raise, yeah, you're a quiet bunch. Um, raise your hands, uh, you know, write in the chat, you know, anything that you like. Um, hey, Chris. Oh. <laughs> I just saw Chris, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I see that David uh, has another question there, um, asking sure. whether there are academics at UPEI who have expertise to devise measures. And uh, is that, you know, what kinds of measures are you thinking about, David? Do you want to clarify? 
Well, sure. We were talking about the fact that there's so little measurement. I mean, and that we need to have a uh, sort of uh, a pre and post measurement in order to see if uh, the efficacy of any program. So uh, I would think that in the social science departments, there would be people who um, would have good expertise in devising these kinds of measures uh, that perhaps could be uh, part of a part of the bill to, to propose, yeah. yes, this is how we'll do it. We'll uh, uh, perhaps have a grant for uh, studies from UPEI if there are people with that expertise. Yeah, for sure. And if government felt that they didn't have the expertise in house, that would absolutely be a way that they could do it. Um, I mean, well, if they're clear, not doing it, then who has the expertise? I'm wondering. It, uh, to be clear, <laughs> David, it's, it's not less. It's not necessarily a lack of expertise. It's. Yeah. It, I mean, the data. If you look in the in, in the um, the legislation, we've already provided yeah. a, a sort of table of kind of basic indicators that we know, and this is all right. data that currently exists. So, okay. for those who yeah. can't see it, it's examples like. Um, people measuring the number of people who are not in employment, education, or training, right. number of licensed childcare spaces, um, core housing need, um, mm -hmm. high school graduation rates, income inequality rates. This is all actually data that we currently have. Nobody's collecting it in, and, 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 and like the two, two big things, you have to collect it consistently. Mm -hmm. You have to, and some of this data is, is in the province. You have to, disaggregate it so you have to break it down like you talked about earlier which is are we are we coll collecting gender like male female um age and where they live for example would be the mm -hmm. minimum that we'd want to collect and then are we are we doing something with it you know are we then using that to inform policy so when i so i you know i'm i'm obviously do a lot of work in housing mm -hmm. i have over the last two years gotten more than 15 different numbers of how many people are waiting on the housing list. Huh. And it turned out it was because there were 13 different housing lists. Yeah. Huh. Right. So, so some people were on the list once, some people were on more than one list, some people weren't on any list. So mm. the lists weren't all collecting the same stuff. When they finally got all the lists together, made one list, now we can say, okay, I can go and look in that list and I can say how many people we have on the housing list, but it took two years <laughs> oh, <laughs> because geez. nobody had ever, you know, like it, 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 they weren't, they weren't collecting the data to count how many they were collecting the data so they could, Montague could suit Montague and, you know, so, mm -hmm. so it's not necessarily that we need more academic, it's that we need political will ah, yeah. and we need responsibility. And when you've got legislation that says you must do this, that's a pretty big stick. Mm -hmm. To be really blunt, I mean it's 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 unfortunate, but that's that's how we can get this stuff happening. Is we can we need to actually require it through law. Yes. Um, and so that's one of the things I've asked is is you know what else should we be measuring? Mm -hmm. You know I've, I've got a list in there, but and one of the things that was raised by. Um, one of the groups that I consulted with was um, we need to be measuring more things around social justice. So, you know, we need to look at sort of things from more of a social justice angle, because a lot of these are, are really economic. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do how and, and, you know, even down to wellness, like how are people feeling? What's the you know, what's what's our rate of diagnosed depression? Yes. You know, um, how many people yeah. leave? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, David. Uh, I'm going to go to Darcy. You have a question. Please unmute. I do. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, uh, when hey, Darcy. We were, how you doing, hon? Uh, when we were talking about, uh, you know, with a basic income, you know, what, what else do we still need? And, you know, I just wanted to mention, you know, we have a son with a disability. So I have that experience of disability supports as a parent. Yeah. And um, we've never gone in for an annual review and seen the same person twice. Yeah. So since the age of uh, 18, uh, never the same person twice, that's seven years. 
And I know that the people, when we first see them at the, we go in and meet them, they're so enthusiastic and they're so happy and they want to help. But I know that all they do, all they really have time for is to do an annual review. And what they're doing is checking to see that people are not gaming the system. They're uh, basically, they're just a bean counter. And then when they're done, they file the report and you're set for the next year. And then when you go in the following year, you see someone new. So I really think, you know, working with social workers as I did at, at CLIA, you know, on family violence and, and things like that, you know that they want to do their jobs. They want to help people. You know, the people working in disability supports want to help people. And I think having the money set through basic income would really give them that great opportunity to actually do what they're trained to do, which is to help people with specific supports for individuals. So I see that, you know, they'll, there's still gonna be a place for them. And, and it actually, you know, I think it'd be a better place. No, and I, I, think, I think it's a huge piece of um, over and over and over again, when we talk to people about, the, you know, the experience of working, dealing with social development or with social assistance in, in its very many spaces, whether it's for seniors or disabilities or family, um, is how undignified it is. You know, how you're treated, you know, whether, and it's not necessarily because it's, the, you know, the, the staff got sort of, like you said, they don't set out there to be mean. Um, the system is just is designed to de to deny. Um, it's designed to to be to, re to take away people feeling um, that they're valued, and that's that's soul destroying for the people that work in it, and it's soul destroying for the people that are in that system. And and you know, we whatever we need to do to address poverty, we need to look at the system as well. Like it's not just a matter of chucking money at it. And, and so I think one of the things we did is that makes this a wicked problem when we talk about addressing poverty is, is it's not actually just money. It is very much, um, you know, what are we trying to do? And that's why one of the key things that we put in this legislation were the principles. Um, and the principles actually sort of are a way for you to say what really matters to you. I'm just, I'm scrolling again on my, my, um, Thing here so I can find it but we, we looked at the principles that we had also used in the um, um, basic income report and one of the key things in there is that people need to be treated with with dignity um, and that the system needs to be designed to recognize that all people are equal and have equal value regardless of how they contribute to society and, and I do think, Darcy, absolutely, the basic income guarantee is, is the fundamentally the, the best way we can achieve that. Um, but I am not putting it as, as the, the thing in here because it is, that's actually only one tool. Um, I personally, I think it's gonna take a while um, for us, because especially mainly because of the pandemic as much as anything else, for us to get to the point where we can begin really serious negotiations about a basic income guarantee for PEI. We need to be moving right now so we can actually begin to, to chip away at the edges of the crappy system that we currently have and make it better even if it's a small amount while getting ready for those other bigger steps um part of the approach of of this is any improvement is improvement and ideally we can go you know abcm because we get to that but we don't want to sort of have sat for three or four years and uh, waiting to negotiate with federal government or having that something proper happen um, around basic income and not have moved it forward in the meantime. Oh yeah, I love the timelines, Hannah. I love, love. <laughs> timelines good. are timelines are always good. Uh, yeah, and Toby aggressive McDonald's. ones even better, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Toby McDonald uh, has uh, a couple of uh, questions. Uh, Toby, do you want to get on the blow blow horn here and ask away? So Hannah, I'm wondering on the aspect of data collection and you probably don't have an answer for this, but I am wondering for individuals who may not have their own home or rent, I guess I put that they might, not, they're not homeless, but technically they're homeless um, and they're between homes. Mm -hmm. So they're living with friends or family. Do you have the data on that? Like, or... No. Will you be collecting data on that? And how do you plan on doing that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, it, and, and, you know, it's it, a really critical part of the story around homelessness. So we identified chronic homelessness using a, an official de designation, which literally is people who are, who are, you know, living in shelters, extended period of time. But what you're talking about is, is a really key, and it's actually the largest group homelessness. Mm -hmm. Well, is, what I'm thinking of is you have a young, a younger uh, group of individuals. You have a uh, young adults who are graduating from high school, your university students, young adults, they don't, they are not making enough financially to get out on their own. I mean, I can remember whenever I was 18, I mean, out, yeah. rent an yeah. apartment. The, the cost of apartments now that we're seeing advertised, if one even comes up, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no way a single person or relatively a can afford it That's you know right. you're looking for at least one or two roommates and let's face it like some people just don't want to live with anybody else they would they would <laughs> you know they would rather be by themselves and maybe that's the best thing for them but yeah. i'm just wondering if that's going to be part of the data collected absolutely yeah and, and there's you know housing is obviously a really key piece of of our story when we talk about poverty and even more so for us in PEI with the you know the pressures that we're under here so we can have you know what's called housing insecure where you're not really sure you know like we and we see that a lot where um students or, or younger people are in apartments but they only have the apartment for eight months because it's going to be an Airbnb in the summer right so that's housing insecure we don't don't know where for sure if you're going to be okay yeah. transitional homelessness is people who are couch surfing or you know like living with their relatives for the weeks or they're out of the trailer in the summer well, um, like my son, was, my son was renovated. I mean, he's yeah. living with us. I mean, we're fortunate enough we have the space and yeah. he's in no rush to get out. But I, I mean, I'm looking at, we can't be the only parents that no. have our children living yeah. at home. We, I mean, that's, I think part of it is, is that data, like, you know, back to being a wicked problem that we, we really need that information because again, we're like, we can, for instance, we have, uh, right now, I have a really hard time when I'm arguing for affordable housing investment from the government because they keep coming back to me saying, well, what do you mean? We don't we, we don't have a problem. You know, they're building all these great apartments and they're renting them out. Uh, they, they, that whole that whole experience is invisible to unless you're in it. Right. So so unless we actually find a way to collect that information and make it exactly. part of our decision making, we're not going to make decisions on it. Because and that's really my son has an address right that's right but so he's he fine <laughs> exactly but as far as the government is concerned yeah. yeah but there's no apartments yeah. um within his price range for him to move into he, well and, and, and affordable it. affordable housing i'm sorry for um uh how core housing need, which is, which I've actually identified as one of our indicators is, is again, it's complex, but core, in the, the simplest way to put it is you're in housing need if you are challenged either because of quality of your housing, like it's not okay, yeah. the cost of your housing, so the affordability, or the appropriateness, you know, like your family of three living in a one bedroom apartment. So those are the three things that say, you know, you need housing. So when I, when, when we say in our, in our data measurement, we're going to need to measure core housing need. That's a pretty simple line for a really large, complex amount of information. And one of the ways that we can do that um, is by setting up a rental registry. So, you know, in terms of how do you collect data, collecting data is you have to do it the right way. So you need to do it properly. You need to protect people's privacy and it needs to be accurate um, and it needs to be continuous. So a rental registry would allow us to collect, you know, what rental properties are out there, how much are they, what was the rent that was charged last year and the year before? And also how many people are registered that need housing yeah. and what do they need? Um, so that way we can, we can have a better story. If there's one central point where you collect all of that, then we have a really good story that says, you know, here's what we've got, here's what we need, here's where the gap is, who are those people? And then what do we need then to invest in? Um, because frankly, building the right kind of housing is one of the ways that we would address poverty. Yeah. Now, right? Um, for the rental units that have been built within the last couple of years that are supposed are the percentage that is supposed to be for affordable housing. Yep. Now, 
I, some individuals are saying, well, there's a time limit on that. Is that accurate or inaccurate? Like there's a 10 year limit and then it gets reevaluated. Like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'll tell you now, I, I know Jordan will probably back with it. I could probably, and probably should do an entire another one of these just on how housing works in PEI because it's really complicated. Mm. Um, but I'll give you a short answer. Um, and then Toby, what I would suggest is either you and I have another chat because I've got, I've got a lot, so let's set that up and I'll answer your question now. And then why don't we do this as a follow-up, okay. either another event or you and I. Absolutely. A, so the short answer is, um, uh, if a developer gets money to ensure that a unit is offered on an affordable basis and he is contractually obligated to and provide that for a length of time, the contract should be 20 years. There were a number that were signed that were not. There were only 10. So, um, and that's what we need to talk about. <laughs> okay, so another question, do you feel that the government should be building, should be building affordable houses themselves or affordable apartments themselves or am i <laughs> am i overstepping my bound no no i i will i will give you a, a diplomatic answer and then again a, a, this is a, a housing topic but but in terms of for poverty we have to housing a housing strategy is a critical part of how we address poverty which is when i talked about it earlier that poverty doesn't just fit one little space it's across all of government government are not really good at doing things cost effectively um, I still think that the best way that government can do can a bit do good housing would be to give the right people the money and get and get the hell out of the way, um, but make sure that there are contracts in place to make to ensure that it is airtight that it remains. Yes. You know what I would like to see us investing in is housing cooperatives. Yes. And I think it's shocking that we don't have government support for housing cooperatives because they are the most cost effective, creative, and community owned approaches to housing that no. would give us what people actually want that's my answer darcy will like that answer <laughs> I, I like that i like that answer housing cooperative get get people on their feet yeah exactly um i, like I saw a thing. question <laughs> i saw yeah, a question yeah, in, in the chat here from pauline about the strategy to sell this exactly. whole thing to the paul to the pcs i think it's a really good question to maybe finish up on if, uh, if that's okay jordan yeah, um, uh, let's see. Emily, I see, is, has her hand okay. up too. So let's see. Do you want to go to Emily and then I'll, I'll talk about the strategy really quickly to wrap up? Okay. Sorry. I just had a couple more things to say and questions. Sure. Um, so uh, I remember when you said about language and how you reminded some of the ministers to check their, um, their language and words matter. And yeah. um, I thought it was very important and it was poignant when you said it and they and they needed to hear that. But um, I'm curious uh, what the government's response was to the, you know, the the data for the 50,000 families um, or people, sorry. And mm -hmm. can you speak to other jurisdictions or countries where they've improved poverty? Um, and third was what services would be freed up with the universal basic income guarantee okay so government hasn't formally responded on the the 50,000 okay. data number the basic income report was okay. accepted in the, in the legislature but um i can guarantee you that most of the people there probably didn't read it to that level of data um i do know that as i said right back at the beginning every time we talk about the number it's shocking um and i'll make sure i ask them in person <laughs> to talk about it when I get the chance. Um, other countries that have addressed poverty, um, no one has really done a fabulous job, but there are some places that are doing better than others. Certainly, um, Finland has been phenomenal with their approach to with Housing First, which is um, specifically addressed. Uh, they've basically eradicated homelessness, okay. um, which has had a huge impact. And, and Countries that have um, um, strong food programs for children um, have much lower food insecurity rates for children. The challenge is often that they're connected to school um, and then it's what do you do on holidays and, and, right. and that kind of piece. Um, it's, it's really we have become very, as a society, very complacent with this as our norm, especially in the Western, the Western right. world. Right, yeah. And, and that, you yeah. know, 
I, I think that's one of those things of somebody has to go first. <laughs> so that's another part yeah. of it. In terms of things that would happen with universal basic income, if we were able to, or what we're looking at is a guaranteed basic income. So, the, the, and this is uh, the recommendation that came from our, our committee report. So this is that not every person would get that. It would be based on your income. So if you earn $100,000 a year, you don't, you don't need to get this. It would, it would cut off right. um, gradually um, right. at the, once you're outside the market, the top of the market measure. Um, so, which makes it more cost effective as well, that you're not giving money to people who effectively may not need it. Um, right. Which is, you know, it, which is challenging, but it is, it is a way to balance the economic with the other. However, it means that all of the people that we're talking about in this space are eligible for the guaranteed living right. income. Um, if we were able to yes. bring that in, what that would do would, would be effectively to eliminate the basic, that core of our, what we currently have as social assistance. Um, and a okay. number of associated other programs that are linked to your income testing. The main thing that it does more than the okay. money is that it takes away um, what's called conditionality. And conditionality, which is something what Darcy was talking about to some extent as well, is where you have to prove that you need this. Um, you have to prove right. your need. And when you're on social assistance, you right. have to prove you need every month. Um, when you're on disability, you have to prove you need every year, if not more. Um, and so what this does is say, if you filed your tax return and your tax return shows that you are below the market basket measure, you are automatically going to receive your guaranteed basic income. No questions asked. And you, and you get it for the year, no questions asked. And it's when you redo your tax return and it's, and, um, and you're not asked how you spend it. You're not asked to submit receipts you don't have to go and interview with anybody you know now if you then say okay i get this right. i'm getting this but i i need child care then you would you would mm -hmm. have child care on top of that if you need additional medical support you have an right. ostomy or you know all those so all of those so we have a like in our basic income report which is also listed linked in my um from our website um my, from the web the web page where we posted this um We've got there in there kind of the kind of the list of it's, it's, it's a whole list of all the programs that would need to remain. Right. Now, ideally, okay. you know, you, you clean those up and make them, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the shift in how you get the money. And like Darcy said, what it is, is dignity. You're, you're being given the money that you need when you need it um, without needing to sort of do anything else except accept uh, file your tax return. Right, That's which it. I think is, yeah, moves right into what you're about to say, how to sell it to the government. Cause I think they always like their- Yeah, yeah. yeah so their, this particular Their data, their facts, and then how it's gonna save. Yeah, so, so the pushback on this legislation is gonna come from a couple of different places. One of them is um, um, why should we help people who can't help themselves? And that's a pretty common pushback is those people just need to go out and get a job. You know, it's welfare moms and like that kind of language. There's not a lot you can do with that, except talk about the, the, the facts that actually like a large percentage of these people are either seniors or they're under 18 or they are unable to work because they have uh, a disability. Um, but on top of that, none of your damn business. Right, but that's that doesn't usually fly so well. Um, so that's a pretty common pushback, and it can get said in a lot more, a lot of different ways. But, but that that will also happen within the legislature that people will bring in that attitude, and that's one that we need to get ready for. Um, but the broader attitude would be, well, how will we pay for this? And that's impossible to do for that long. One of the things I point out is what I said in my interview is we've just committed to some pretty rigorous climate targets, which look an awful lot like these. If we can pass that and be okay with all the investment and the commitment and the programs and doing whatever. We have no idea how we're gonna do that, right? We've got all these little programs and things going on, but we have no idea how we're gonna, but we are because we've committed to them. We can do that for poverty too. It's, it's an, and in terms of with the PCs, there is a very clear commitment from Denny um, to this in the original throne speech and the commitment to the poverty action plan in the mandate letters for his ministers um, and so I have a trail of commitment 
to this action. Um, so the targets are kind of, I, I balance off against the climate targets and the, the overall commitment to legislation is you committed to doing this and I'm just helping you by getting it, getting doing, doing the homework for you, you're welcome. Maybe not quite such cheeky, but that's the, uh, that's the, the general approach. Okay, well, thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you so much to all of our participants for, uh, for the great uh, questions and, and conversation and feedback tonight. Uh, I saw there were a couple of people that, that arrived just in the last few minutes. Uh, you might have thought that it, it started at 8, but don't worry. We recorded this session, and so I will uh, share a recording with everybody who registered. And I'll also be sending out, uh, again, the links to uh, Hannah's draft, uh, consul consultation draft of the legislation, and information on how you can um, provide your feedback. You're looking to receive comments before February 12th, right, Hannah? Yeah, if possible. Um, we're we're going to need to sort of do a redo the draft um, and then get it back in. So they have to be formally prepared by Ledge Council, by the lawyers um, who work in the Legislative Council office. So any changes I make have to go back to them to be redrafted. But like I said, we have we have some some weeks to um, um, to work on this, and and the feedback, getting that feedback, is the most important. So really look forward to anything you've got to share. Great, thank you. So yeah, we hope that you do share your feedback. And uh, if, you, uh, if you have an MLA who's not a green MLA, make sure you uh, send them a note and let them know that you uh, hope that they'll support Hannah's bill when it gets tabled, uh, hopefully this spring. That would be hugely supportive actually, Jordan. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, if, if, you, if you are able to send um, an email or a letter to, ML, to your MLA or to, and or to the premier, um, that really helps when it comes to me going, because I go and talk all, with all of them as individually as much as possible, see if I can get them on board, a lot of negotiation. Um, and if they've got that, if they know that their voters are, are um, supportive of it, then that makes things more likely. So that would be really appreciated. All right. Well, th so thank much. you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll wish everybody a very good night. And. Uh, Remember, this was only the, the second of six of these uh, outside the rail sessions with Green MLAs. Uh, tomorrow at the same time, seven o'clock, we will be joined by Lynn Lund, who is drafting uh, legislation for an environmental bill of rights for Prince Edward Island. So that's very cool. Uh, next week on Wednesday, we've got Steve Howard. He'll be talking about his uh, two bills that are aiming to modernize electricity on Prince Edward Island. Uh, the day after that, on Thursday, we'll have Trish Altas talking about a couple of bills that she is working on um, related to health. Uh, so creating accountability uh, with between health PEI and the Minister of Health, as well as uh, clarifying uh, the sharing of information with, uh, with caregivers of people that are in care. And, uh, and then finally, um, the week after that, on February 17th, we'll have Ola Hammerland, uh, and he will be talking to us about the, the work that he's been doing on net zero uh, buildings. Um, so Ola, he's not working on a, on a bill for this sitting, but he uh, has passed a, a motion and he's doing some more work around this and has a lot of experience as a green architect designing uh, net zero buildings. And so uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, how he thinks that that could really help us reach our, our climate targets. So uh, thank you very much. We hope to see you at future sessions and have a very good night. Bye, everybody. Bye.